Zuikaku. In Japanese, the word meant auspicious crane. Ever since its commissioning in September 1941, Zuikaku had been the backbone of the combined fleet's air offensives. On December 7, 1941, its planes attacked Pearl Harbor, striking American airfields at Kaneohe and Hickam. At the Battle of the Coral Sea, its planes had helped to sink USS Lexington and damaged another carrier, USS Yorktown. Then, at the Battle of Santa Cruz, Zuikaku's dive bombers had put three bombs into USS Hornet, sending it to the bottom of the South Pacific. And at the Battle of the Philippine Sea, it had escaped destruction after receiving a heavy dive bombing attack from Task Force 58. Zuikaku was the last of the six Japanese carriers that had carried out a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Predictably, Admiral William Halsey wanted it obliterated. Late in the day on October 24, 1944, an American search plane found Zuikaku traveling 190 miles northeast of Cape Engano, the northeastern tip of Luzon. At last, vengeance for Pearl Harbor could be satisfied. During the Battle of Leyte Gulf, Zuikaku served as the flagship of Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa. It traveled in the company of 25 other ships, the so-called Northern Force. Halsey's decision to track it down came automatically. He believed it posed the greatest threat to the American landings at Leyte. Therefore, Third Fleet needed to pursue it without delay. About 300 miles separated the two fleets, but Halsey's fleet was equipped for speed, with most ships able to make at least 27 knots. If his ships went out immediately, they could close the distance during the nighttime hours. After a long evening consultation with his staff, Halsey ordered his scattered task groups to assemble near his flagship, USS New Jersey, and head north. All the while, one of his light carriers, USS Independence, received contact reports from its night fighting squadron, which located Ozawa's ships several times between 2.14 and 2.35 a.m., October 25th. With these updates, Halsey made certain that the Northern Force would not escape from his clutches. Prior to dawn, the first wave of strike planes, 180 altogether, took off from Halsey's carriers. Lieutenant Junior Grade William Davis III was among that group. He belonged to VF-19, a squadron assigned to the new USS Lexington. That morning, Davis took the controls of his Grumman F-6F Hellcat. Normally, for such a mission, Hellcats were utilized as escort fighters. But this morning, his squadron received orders to operate as fighter bombers. Each Hellcat carried a 500-pound bomb under one of its wing stubs. Davis and his shipmates had orders to dive on the Japanese carriers, release their payloads, and then use their wing guns to strafe the smaller Japanese ships. Davis remembered the eerie solitude as his plane began its lengthy trek. We manned our planes in total darkness. I took a momentary glance at the 500-pound bomb hanging under my wing and hoped I wouldn't have to dump it before we got to the enemy fleet. Once the entire air group was together, we climbed slowly towards the north. We hung in the night sky, unaware of our speed. The noise of my engine had long since disappeared. The entire scene was unreal. We were each in our own universe, that tiny cockpit. I was strangely calm. In fact, I was totally relaxed. I had never felt real fear, despite the dangers of the previous actions I'd been in. Why was that? I certainly wasn't particularly brave, and I certainly didn't want to die. Could pure hatred drive someone to do the unimaginable? Did everyone in my squadron feel the same way? There were many questions, but no answers. Davis and his shipmates cruised at 22,000 feet. They were part of a massive airstrike that involved 65 Curtis SB-2C Helldivers, 55 General Motors TBM Avengers, and 60 Grumman F-6F Hellcats. The flight took about two hours, and at 8.15, Ozawa's fleet came into sight. Fortunately for the Americans, the Japanese didn't have many aircraft available to protect their fleet. At dawn, Ozawa had sent 75 of his carrier planes to perform a shuttle bomb mission. 
That is, he ordered them to attack the Third Fleet and then fly to airfields in the Philippines to rearm for another attack. Consequently, only 30 fighter planes protected Ozawa's fleet when the first American airstrike arrived. In the opening minutes, the American fighters slaughtered the Japanese combat air patrol. 21 planes were shot down. The other nine survived, but they ended up ditching in the Philippine Sea when they learned that all their aircraft carriers were damaged or unable to recover aircraft. The strike coordinator, Commander David McCampbell, directed the American squadrons to their targets. In a few minutes, the Americans dispatched a destroyer, the Akizuki. A well-aimed aerial torpedo detonated inside the ship's forward engine room, which in turn caused a secondary explosion at the torpedo mount. In a huge blast, Akizuki was ripped apart, killing 183 sailors. At the same time, USS Essex planes attacked Chidose, one of the light carriers. Chidose took three torpedo hits, which caused its boiler rooms to flood. The rudder went dead, and the ship developed a 27-degree list. Damage control parties failed to contain the flooding, and one hour after getting hit, Chitose rolled over, drowning 900 of its crew. Meanwhile, Helldivers and Hellcats from USS Enterprise went after Zuiho. After a slew of near misses, one pilot struck Zuiho with a 1,000-pound bomb on the rear of its flight deck. The explosion bulged the flight deck so that planes couldn't land. The steering went out, and several large fires erupted. Finally, Lexington's group went after the big target, Zuikaku. One of VF-19 section commanders, Lieutenant William Masoner, led his Hellcats in a shallow dive. Lieutenant J.G. Bill Davis was there with him. He remembered flying through the heavy flak. I allowed the plane to stall and let the nose drop. All I could see was the deck of that aircraft carrier. I cracked the throttle slightly so the engine wouldn't stall and let the plane fall. The response was instantaneous, as all the anti-aircraft guns in the Japanese fleet opened up. They knew where I was going, and they didn't have to leave me. They fired directly up over the carrier. In moments, at 10,000 feet, there was a black cloud of bursting shells from the 40mm and 5-inch guns. It was so thick, I couldn't see through it. I knew I'd be dead in the next 30 seconds, but I also knew that if I had it to do over again, with all the other alternatives that I had, I'd be here now. I flashed through the cloud, knowing it was filled with screaming metal from the explosions. I expected to feel the plane jolt at any second, but I continued on. A second deadly cloud was forming at 4,000 feet from the exploding 20 millimeter shells. It was directly over the carrier, and I had no choice but to fly through it. Once again, my luck held. I screamed down on the carrier, which now completely filled my gun sight. I rested my finger on the bomb release button. I kept going. I wanted to make sure I got a hit. When it seemed as if I was going to hit the ship, I pushed the release and pulled out. I had not looked at my altimeter or airspeed. I was way over the red line of the aircraft and, of course, blacked out from the G-forces on the pullout. After pulling up from his dive, Davis had to worry about the neighboring escort ships. He nearly lost his life when he almost collided with an enemy cruiser. Blood instantly returned to my brain, and I could see again. But what I saw scared me to death. I was so low, I was clipping the spray from the waves. I was also 40 knots over the maximum speed for the plane. The main thing was, I made it. Until I looked up ahead. I was flying right into the side of the Oyoto, a Japanese heavy cruiser. I pulled back on the stick and nothing happened. I couldn't gain altitude. The elevator control must have been frozen due to the speed. Putting up both hands on the stick and bracing myself against the rubber pedals, I pulled with all my strength. The nose rose slightly enough to clear the hull but not enough to clear the superstructure. I was going to hit the ship. At the last moment, I tried the aileron. It responded, and in that instant, I rolled the plane on its right side and flew between the cruiser's second gun turret and the bridge. I was perhaps three feet from the windows on the bridge, 
and could see the Japanese officers and enlisted men commanding the ship. There was an admiral in dress whites, complete with sword. The other officers and men were also in dress whites. I was going 530 miles an hour and only got a glimpse, but that image is impressed on my mind forever. The bombs from Lexington's VF-19 and VB-19 planes tore into Zuikaku with incredible fury. In quick succession, three 500-pound bombs struck Zuikaku's flight deck, starting a fire in the main hangars. Two minutes later, the carrier received a torpedo hit to its port side. Several compartments flooded, and the ship developed a 30-degree list. With his flagship damaged, Ozawa called for aid. Promptly, Oyota came alongside so that he could transfer his flag, but this was spotted by the Americans. Over the radio, VF-19 skipper Lieutenant Commander Hugh Winters called out, They're trying to take the Admiral's staff on a cruiser. Go down and strafe it. Having just flown by Oyoto, Davis whipped his Hellcat around for a second pass. We peeled off and dove on Oyoto, which had pulled up astern of the carrier. Officers were jumping from the carrier to the forward deck of the cruiser. They were huddled together. We tore them to pieces. No one could have survived the fire of our machine guns. I only hoped that this was the same staff that was aboard when they attacked Pearl Harbor. When that attack took place, I was a student in college. I never in my wildest imagination thought that I'd have a chance to avenge that attack. I felt the greatest satisfaction... I ever felt in my life. Despite the Americans' best efforts, Ozawa was not killed. He successfully transferred to Oyoto when the American carrier planes finally quit the area. When the Americans finally expended all their ordnance, four enemy ships were burning. Only one American plane, a TBM Avenger, had been lost. But the battle was not finished. At 9.49 a.m., more than an hour after the first attack, a second wave of American planes arrived. Now the Americans concentrated on Chioda, the only undamaged light carrier. In 15 minutes, Chioda suffered at least four damaging bomb strikes. Fires broke out below decks and some magazines had to be flooded to prevent a secondary explosion from occurring. Consequently, due to the sudden intake, the ship listed 13 degrees to starboard and Helm lost control of its steering. Then, at 12.25, an hour and a half later, a third wave of American planes arrived. This time, the Navy pilots turned their attentions to Zuikaku and Zuiho. Zuiho took heavy damage from two bombs and one torpedo. The portside engine room flooded completely, the ship listed 13 degrees to starboard, and soon it went dead in the water. As for Zuikaku, it endured nine more bomb strikes and a well-coordinated anvil attack with TBMs attacking simultaneously from the port and starboard bow. Unable to dodge out of the way, Zuikaku took six aerial torpedo strikes. Exactly like Zuiho, Zuikaku's engine rooms flooded. More fires spread throughout the hangar decks, and the carrier listed hard to port. At 1.25 p.m., the engine sputtered out, and Helm lost control of the rudder. Zuikaku was dead in the water. It became clear to Captain Takeo Kaizuka that Zuikaku could not be saved. Two minutes after the loss of the engines, Kaizuka assembled all hands on the starboard side of the flight deck, which was now jutting high out of the water. From the island structure, Kaizuka bid a final farewell to his sailors, telling them that he intended to go down with the ship. All hands saluted as his staff lowered Zuikaku's ensign. Meanwhile, a bugler played Kimigayo, the Japanese national anthem. The whole scene bore an air of dignity, but the American pilots wished to spoil this as well. In the middle of the ceremony, a TBM Avenger piloted by Ensign Mike Krauss buzzed the carrier, interrupting the proceedings. Angered at having their anthem broken by the roar of aircraft engines, the sailors on Zuikaku began shaking their fists at the unruly American pilot. In the belly of the TBM, Radioman First Class Arthur Kropp responded by holding his hand up to the rear window and extending his middle finger. After 30 minutes of ceremonies, Kaizuka finally ordered abandoned ship. 
862 officers and men managed to get clear of Zuikaku before it went under, and they were rescued by the destroyers Wakutsuki and Kuwa. But not everyone made it. At 2.14 p.m., Zuikaku slipped beneath the waves, taking with it 842 sailors. Most were already dead, but a few were still alive, trapped below decks. As all this transpired, a fourth American wave arrived to deliver the last blow to Ozawa's task force. These planes went after Zuiho and Chiyoda, which were still afloat. Chiyoda received one more direct hit, and Zuiho received several near misses. This last attack disrupted the repair operations on both ships, and eventually, Captain Kuro Sugiora ordered Zuiho abandoned. With comparatively little fanfare, that ship slipped under the waves at 3.30 p.m. Then, at 4.20, a surface squadron from Halsey's 3rd Fleet under Rear Admiral Lawrence Dubose reached Chioda's position. Dubose's squadron consisted of four cruisers and nine destroyers. They attempted to sink Chioda with naval gunfire. Repair operations had already been disrupted several times, so the ensuing surface battle only worsened the situation below decks. Finally, at 4.55, Chioda rolled over and went under. Nearly its entire crew of 970 sailors perished. Before leaving, Dubose's squadron sank one of Chioda's escorts, the Hatsuzuki, bringing the Battle of Cape Engano to a dramatic end. Back in 1941, after the air raid on Pearl Harbor, the combined fleet's commander, Isoroku Yamamoto, was purported to have said, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. If he actually said those lines, they were prophetic. Considering the wholesale slaughter of Japanese ships and planes at Cape Engano, that prediction had certainly come to pass. <laughs> <laughs> 